Let's Play Live presents The League of Legends High School League Powered by Logitech G Tech Cafe and Computer Power Plus In partnership with Xerium, Playtech and the New Zealand Esports Federation Welcome to the LPL Logitech G Esports Arena, where we've got a different game every day of the week. But today is Saturday, and you know what that means. It's high school league time, it's the grand finals. And first up, of course, we have got the Challenger Division Finals, with two teams. One from Tauranga is Aquinas, and then from Auckland is going to be North Coat College. Two very high tier teams right now, and my name, is Matt Smite Ross. I've got two amazing gentlemen here on the analyst desk with me tonight, Johnny Cyclone Weatherly and Jamie as well. Here they are for you to see, as well as the great shields we've got because we like to promote esports as almost like it should be a real sport at schools, right guys? It absolutely is a real sport, Matt. I think so. I mean, look, this is a shield that you'd expect to see coming out from other things like your rugby, your basketball, even debating, because that's kind of in the same realm as this sort of thing, right guys? So. As we get into the finals, the players, of course, are standing by. Let's talk about what we can expect from the Challenger League finals, right? You've got Aquinas coming from one side of the bracket, has taken out quite a lot of tough competition, but at the same time, they're still coming in as the underdog. On the other side, North Coat College. And these guys have been tearing through Challenger Division, right? They've been a huge carry from the top lane, so this is going to be an incredible matchup, but I've been, I've been putting Aquinas as the underdog on this finals. I think so, you know, throughout the entire Challenger series we've always seen scrappy games and it's just so fitting that we've got Aquinas and Northcote here, the two scrappiest teams I think in the whole Challenger division, to take it out here in the Armageddon stage. So whoever takes it out, we'll soon see, but it should be exciting. So something that's important to talk about, and I'm going to ask you about this here, Johnny, is that Aquinas are a team that in almost all of their games, they've just been ahead the whole time. They've never been behind. Now they're going to be really tested. Can they play from behind? What, what's the difference in strategy for playing that way? Yeah, dealing with a one threat team versus a two threat team can be quite different and you know quite complicated because so we've got Northco having the absolute star top laner. It's big, big, big threat for them. And I'm really interested to see if Aquinas can Put enough pressure to neutralize them while still getting their mid laner going because they've got two threats. So I'm really interested to see how they balance that um, need for pressure from their jungler. Yeah, so that, that's the question, right? And we'll get into that because we've got to start talking about these individual players coming out from either side. And on Northcote College, it's hard to not mention him, but Taitu from the top lane. If a team doesn't manage to ban his Olaf away, then you're in for a terrible time, right? The thing is though, we are going into tournament drafts, so you can ban that hero away, but wasting a ban on Olaf, I mean, that's going to play into the draft a little bit. We saw it in our plans, you know, Olaf was banned, but that didn't stop this team making it all the way here to the finals, so it's a pick that will be strong, but it's the player that's even stronger behind it. So whatever they decide to draft today, I think will be, you know, a really strong sensor around that top lane, you've mentioned it, and probably quite uh, sort of tame down in the bottom lane. So we'll see where the jungler decides to go and where our pressure is today. And let's again move on to that topic of pocket picks. The champion Velkoz, right? He's coming out from Aquinas' side. The support role of all places, of course, has a pocket pick in Velkoz. Now the question is, will Northcote look to ban away this hero? Is it worth throwing a ban on it? It's definitely not to the level of Titus Olaf, but it can throw a bit of a spanner in the works. I think the, the Velkoz probably can be abused if you are confident that you understand its strengths and weaknesses. If you feel like you can play keep away um, as the Velkoz, then you're going to be pretty confident, which is probably what Aquinas thinks that they can do. I would love to see something like a Leona or an Alistar come out to really abuse that mobility, but it depends whether that's something that North Coast feel comfortable doing. Yeah, and you've got to talk about comfort picks as well, and then also contested picks. And a big one here is going to be Tristana. A massive AD carry, not just in the high school league, but in the world championships itself, right? I mean, Tristana has been a massive power pick for a lot of teams. And in the fifth game in the series last night against SK Telecom, right, uh, Mis uh, Misfits 
lost the game simply due to a Tristana just getting out of control. So we can relate that here. A snowballing champion. Both of these teams like to snowball their lead out of control. Tristana is one of the best ways to do that in the late game. Such reliable damage, you know. In a three game series, we can expect these games to go quite for some time, you know. And if we're going to be going back and forth, having a reliable damage sensor, being able to build, you know, with such long range as well is going to be so important, I think, for these teams. Because in the Challenger division, we've seen so far, when the leads start to sway a little bit, these, can, these games can go past 40 minutes. So any champion that's able to put out right from the beginning of the game, right to the very end, um, is going to be really highly contested. All right, gentlemen, we're not going to waste too much more time because everyone here live at Armageddon, everyone watching at home, they're here to see the stars of the day. And that is the players themselves, the teams. We've got Dwan standing by to bring both the teams on stage. Yes, good morning and welcome to Armageddon day number two. This is the League of Legends High School Challenger Final. Everybody in Armageddon is fully in here. Thank you for being here and also thank you everyone that's watching this across the stream. It is going to be massive. We've had the very best high schools in the country go head to head in this division and we're down to two. As the gentleman said, we're about to see Aquinas College all the way from Tauranga, Auckland, uh, sorry, Tauranga, New Zealand, up against Northcote from the North Shore of Auckland. Let's meet the first team. Let's welcome up Aquinas College. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, big round of applause. All right, guys, huge day. Look, the crowd is full to their hair to watch you guys go head to head. Oikawa, obviously, is the captain of Aquinas College. You guys are actually the last team today standing from outside of the Auckland region. So talk us through how that feels. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of pressure on us, uh, like carrying the rest of New Zealand to beat out these Auckland teams, but we're looking forward to it. That's right, and obviously, have you and the team been practicing hard? Like, what's the strategy going into this one, which is obviously a big best of three? Uh, our main strategy is to focus on the late game, try scale up, and uh, yeah, win those big team fights. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, this is team number one. This is the Queen of Scholars. Let you guys get back into it. Round of applause. Let you guys get back to the pop. Okawa. Okawa. Okay. That's O-I-K-A-W-A. Okawa. Okawa. What's with this camera angle? They're just holding it. Yeah, so that was team number one here in the Challenger division all the way from Tauranga. But of course, there's another team about to enter into the arena. They come in the form of Northcote College all the way. Well, not too far from here, obviously, being in Auckland, but from the North Shore, they are Northcote College. Let's welcome them into the arena. So we are here uh, with a very uh, big squad that you bring here today. We're here with uh, Sean, who is the teacher in charge of the program at Northcote College. Obviously, huge crowd filtering in here. Obviously, plenty at home on the stream watching this. And firstly, congratulations for making it all the way here. So quick question, how are you and the team feeling? I think I'm actually more nervous than the boys are. They're feeling quite confident today, actually, yeah. And. Uh, any strategy? What are, the, what are the kind of things you guys are going into, uh, going to work on going in against a very, very good team? I think they're just going to rely on their uh, incredible uh, individual skill. I know that uh, Lantern or Nate on uh, support is going to really uh, shot call the game, and I think they're going to uh, go ahead with uh, really, some really good macro as well, so it'll be really cool. Well, we are looking forward to it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Northcote College. You guys jump into the pod. Thank you very much. Good luck. Jungle to mid lane and is now called Illusion. <coughs> Motion to Lady C and support is now Lantern, who is clear love. Introductions and thank you very much to the teams for taking the stage. Now, gentlemen, we're not too far away. The lobby is being set up as we speak. So we've got a few moments before we get into the action. Now, I just want to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the featured lane matchup of this game, right? And I'm going to throw it to you guys straight away. I'm going to say it's the bottom lane because Aquinas, they've got a great top lane, they've got a great mid lane is the bottom lane maybe where Northcote can find some weaknesses? I think uh, if people are looking to play to scaling, like Aquinas said they are, I actually think that if they're picking Tristana and similar type champions, that maybe that we won't see as much action there. I'm hoping we will, because 
there might be a lot of skill mismatchups uh, in the other lanes, but I'm really keen for a really even bot lane. But I don't know if we're going to see much aggression from there based on the strategy they've chosen. They're just going to need to look for some opportunities, right? Because there's, there's a lot that can go wrong in this game. You know, if, if you let a lead slip too far, if you go for that trade that can, you know, kind of zone you off the CS. We have seen them play quite passively for a challenger team, so I, I think they really need to figure out what their game plan is before going into it and then making sure their lane matchups uh, are going to suit well so they can get at least to that 15 minute mark. All right, gentlemen. We're pretty much ready to go, but before we get there, I'm going to ask you that one crucial question. Johnny Cyclone Weatherly, who is going to win this series? I've got Aquinas pick to win this one, 2-1. 2-1 to yeah. Aquinas? All right, Jamie, who's going to take it out? I don't know why we can never agree, but I'm going to say 2-1 to North Coat College today. And you can already hear, I mean, look, this is a big crowd here in Auckland, and they're cheering for the Auckland team. I'm going to give my prediction, and I like getting cheers for me as well. So, North Coat 2 1 is my prediction as well. So, gentlemen, everyone in the audience, everyone watching from home, we're going to send it to Jump and Upstart, who are going to take us through the game. Thank you very much, Smite. I am Alex jump Bravowski, and joining me here today to cast your first final here, your Challenger Finals, is Jake Upstart, Kelly Holtz, and this is going to be an awesome game. It is a big day, a big game. I've cracked out the bow tie. I'm loving it. The crowd seems to be loving it as well. I'm sure the players are also loving it. Everybody's loving it if they haven't got it, and it is. Casters have said it. Big game, two closely tied together teams. Yeah, well, this is going to be the challenge division. They're so close to getting to this final win, and why not do it on the Orkin Armageddon stage? And it is a big stage. For a lot of players, this is a completely brand new experience to be all of a sudden playing League of Legends out of the public eye. I mean, with the HSL, you're already playing League of Legends at school. That's big enough as it is. But all of a sudden now, you're in front of hundreds of people in these pods, and if you look at them, they're green, there's red colored lights everywhere. Completely new environment for them to play in. You can see the crowd there on stream. They're paying very close attention. And that, that attention is on the players. So a lot of nerves are gonna be going through them. And it's gonna be interesting to see how they do react to that. Well, it's, well we're gonna get right into the game very shortly to see who's gonna take out that first win of the best of three series here. And Jake, what do you think, what team is gonna take away the victory overall here today? I do have to align myself with the majority of the analyst's desk saying North Coat 2 and 1. I just think that their team play is going to be able to really outdo Aquinas because we have seen Aquinas struggle when a team has been able to be resilient in those team fights and we've seen them struggle to close out games especially with their heavy early game style. Well, I'm going to unfortunately disagree with you here, Upstar, because I'm going on with Cyclone's prediction saying Aquinas is going to take out the one here, 2-1 to them, because, I mean, Aquinas deserves much love being one of the first high school league teams to ever sign up. But, of course, we, that's just a prediction, of course. We won't know until, until we get, right. at minimum, two games in, and we are only just moving into the first game now. So immediately, I want to see teams come out strong, come out hard, and really start playing to win. Don't let the nerves get to you. Make those proactive plays and really make sure that you can take hold of the game. Because if you win this first game, all of a sudden you're putting the pressure onto the other team. You put the pressure on the losing team who all of a sudden needs to win that 2-0 very quickly. Well, let's do it in Champsit here. The first game of the Challenger Finals. Aquinas College on your blue side, Northcote College on your red side. And we did see the analyst desk highlight quite a lot of picks. We're seeing the Valkos potentially being something. The Olaf taken away immediately. Tierto not going to be able to get onto that champion at all. Really taken away one of his carries. But the Syndra being taken away from Oikawa. Such a powerful pick. Really enables them to play that early game quite well with a lot of scaling. Yeah, and you're also going to see the Calista being banned away. Aquinas not wanting to deal with that on Mawushin, who's been showing to carry hard on that champion. So a good takeaway coming up from then and moving into this kind of really early game, which you see Northcote really excel at. And we're seeing the picks right now coming out from Aquinas being target picks. But Callister and Olaf, while they are quite strong, they're really focused on taking them away from certain players. But you are seeing some of the meta coming through at the same time. You're seeing the Syndra being banned away, powerful mid laner. The Tristana, if you've watched Worlds, you know how potent that champion is on whoever really you want to play it on. And as a result, speaking of Worlds picks, the Janna being taken away, never really being let out. 
but the Melzahar band. That's that another, that's another, pit, that's another uh, band taken straight away from Okwa there in the mid lane because we've seen his Melzahar in the semi finals and he can really hard carry their champion against any mid lane. And this is the thing Okawa, he came out in that interview and said, I carry my team, almost. And as a result, North Coast just go, okay, you carry your team, we're going to take away the tools that you can use to carry it. Take away his Syndra, take away the Melzahar. And both of these champions have white lane dominance, really helping them in that early game. So I'm wondering what he's going to really fall back onto at this stage, whether or not he goes for still a meta pick, maybe something like the Talia, or if he pulls out the pocket pick in this first game right now. Because if you can add some shock factor and add some unpredictability into your draft, even if you lose, even if you win, all of a sudden you're putting North Coast College in a difficult position in terms of preparation. Right now we're just seeing some very kind of generic picks coming out here. The Lulu support going to be the first one for Aquinas and Sejuani and Riven going to be picked by Tai Tu in the top lane. We saw that in the semi-finals upside and it can do wonders. It is very similar to the Olaf in terms of how they want to play. The only difference is crowd reacting there to the Teemo hover. But the Riven and the Sejuani, quite powerful if you ever get the ganking effect. Sejuani paired up with any sort of melee champion in that top lane. Very potent early ganks especially with the mobility of Riven, really being able to close in and get off those melee, get that stun into the knock-up, into the other stun coming out from Riven. Quite a lot of potential there coming out from the bottom lane. And Valkos hover, but the Vayne being picked up here for Ryze in that AD carry position. A Vayne blind pick here for your first game. That shows that he knows what he's doing. He wants to have that Vayne, regardless of what they're going to pick into it. And Vayne, you're kind of opting into that kind of weaker laning phase but looking for that, that really hyper late game. And again, to take it back to that interview, they said that they wanted just to scale up into that late game. Vayne's the perfect champion to do that on. Especially when you do have that Lulu combined with it. It's just a potent lane. It's not exactly weak, but it's not exactly too strong either. You're not looking at it to win very heavily early on, but the scaling. You combine Vayne with the Lulu speed. You allow Ryzy to play so aggressively on this champion. All right now we're seeing that that Braum was the last pick for North Coast to complete that first round. Up. A lot of CC really coming out of the team comp here and you're going to find it very hard for that Bane to really survive throughout the late game as well. The Braum Suns, Sejuani Suns, Riven Suns and knockups. It's going to be so hard for Ryze to perform. And Braum, we did see it. I'll take it back to Worlds again. Braum, if you want to see how it plays into Fed 80 carries, watch last night's game for Misfits um, SKT. You will see Wolf hopefully in a performance that Lantern can copy, just basically preventing any damage coming out from the AD carry. And when you have a Vayne who's going to be providing so much damage, if you can get your wall, block out that damage in front of those key members, prevent the Vayne from getting damage or prevent Vayne from getting off resets, you become so potent in a fight, even without building too many tanky stats. And right now we're just completing out that last round of banning phase and the double ADC ban coming through for Aquinas that Cogman the Zaya ban away nice and quickly and see it'll be the Barris picked up by Mabushin once again world's pick Gunso's Witsian can do a lot of DPS damage very quickly and it's just a champion that has that early laning phase over Vayne we said that Northcote their comp is positioned to win the early game you've got the Riven in the top lane you've got this Varus Brown bottom lane it is an extremely potent lane extremely diff hard, easy pushing lane and with a Velkoz pick potentially coming through, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not this goes to Okawa in the mid or into Pinky down in the bottom lane with a potential Lulu mid coming through. Well, yeah, we've seen that there's a chance of Lulu mid, but it's very low chance. I feel most likely it's going to go with that Vayne. Vayne needs that support down the bot lane. Velkoz doesn't really provide that here, but will it be the Velkoz locked in to go alongside the Galio? Yes, it will be. So you've got the Galio, the Velkoz last pick, most likely top and mid respectively. And that's a pretty well rounded comp for Aquinas. It is, you, if you, depending on what you do, if you do put that Velkos in the middle lane, as you said, I would like it more as a pick, immediately all of a sudden you have that team fighting AoE damage that the Vayne doesn't really have. Vayne very good at bursting down, sort of chipping away at these big tanks, these single target carries. And the Lulu's going to help them to do that if they put in the support role, going to do exactly the same thing in the mid lane. And as a result, you really want to put the Velkos there in that mid lane because you do have that additional damage to come through. But we are seeing it. We do have things in position, so we, as we do cut away, we won't really be able to see what happens until we do get into game. It's going to be, and it is really a matter of potentially getting that Velkoz into what I believe was karma, a, into that karma in the middle end. 
Well, it's going to be really interesting to see because you've got different points of pressure coming out from both these teams. You've got the Riven in the top lane coming out from North Coast, where he's got the Valkos in the mid lane for Aquinas. So it's going to be really interesting how this first part of the game kind of develops and who's going to get this early lead in the first 15 or so minutes. And if we do see the Valkos into the Karma lane, Karma's going to have to push early. She just has stronger AoE. But the Valkos, he's going to scale so well into that late game, especially into a relatively squishy team. Because you've got the Riven in the top lane who's going to be building mostly damage. Sure, she'll transition into a Bruiser, but she never really becomes that tank that you wanted to turn into. And then apart from that, you have the Karma, squishy. You have a Brom, able to really tank up a bit, but not going to transition into the true tank that you want it to be. And as a result, you're going to start to see Valkos be very effective. So when you get to those later stage teamfights, you want to see potentially ganks coming in from the Riven, getting those flanks and making sure that Valkos isn't able just to sit there and get that solid disintegration, disintegration rate going. Yeah, because if this disintegration does come out and hits through the entirety of North Coast, they're going to die very, very quickly. Especially the Varus, who is not one of those ADCs that has a lot of mobility to be able to get out of the ultimate coming out from Valkos. So this is going to be a really, real key position coming out from these carries of North Coast to try to counteract how this Valkos plays. Especially when you consider the fact that they are, when they do get into that late game, they are extraordinarily lacking for damage. And as we do move into the game, important to note, the Lulu has gone to the mid lane for the side of Aquinas. So all of a sudden, that whole the, scaling thing The whole thing, thing has changed. The whole, the whole dynamic of the game has shifted because both of these mid laners are going to become nearly redundant when it comes towards this late game. And although the laning phase does become a bit more equal, if we do expect the Lulu to go for that Arden, um, Arden Sensor um, Unholy Grail build that we do often see these support laners build now, they're both going to sort of have the same issue where it's just a matter of now how much support can they provide to their AD carry in the Varus and in the Vayne respectively. The only difference of course being that North Goat have that additional threat in the top lane. And speaking of threat, they're invading right here. The level 1 invades coming out from their bot lane. And I really like it as well. They have a lot of CC in this first game but it's just going to be for that ward trying to figure out where Captain Hook is going to be using his path lane. And they do just get a few wards in there. Hopefully they can use that to get an early start. Because when you go and look at these lanes, you want to make it safe for Tear Tower on that Riven in the top lane. Because if you do manage to get that lane ahead, you can transition it excellently as you move later on. Riven gonna have the threat if they give her the safety to do it. Because Jarb and Galio, it is quite a potent ganking composition. And they have eyes on Captain Hook right off the get-go. Very well played invade for the side of North Coast. Yeah, and just gives them the freedom in this early game to really kind of do what they want to. They know how you're going to expect Captain Hook to path around his jungle these first couple of levels. They know when Taito is most likely going to be ganked, so they can play around it, look for other opportunities around the map. As you're seeing down in the spot lane, you're seeing Pinky really come out to shine here with the Plasma Fusion with a lot of poke. And that bottom lane, they're now going to have the ability to play hard. They're going to have the ability to play quite strongly into this bottom lane. Because as a result, you're going to see both junglers moving up towards the top side. There's going to be no jungle attention. And while Northcote have that knowledge, Aquinas, it's pure guesswork for them. Obviously, the fact that the bottom lane arrived late after doing that leash is going to provide them a little bit of that information, but they still can't quite be sure. But the junglers at the moment are keeping pace with each other, which means that we could see very early on an exciting, explosive gank in the top lane. Yeah, we're we'll going as well because I would argue that Northcote would probably have that advantage in terms of this ganking power. Sejuani at early levels can be very, very strong, especially with the permafrost here. Coming out to stun out those champions. As we're seeing Dragon hop over the wall, contest the Scuttle Crab as the fight for it continues. But oh! it's going to be Captain Hook seeing it away with the Q and the B and to come along with it. A little bit of early game action, I love it here after that. And that is actually big. All of a sudden, taking away the scuttle as there's a fight oh, in the bottom lane. Find the bottom lane. And first blood going over to Wushin. Will he be able to live this one? Pinky with the auto attack will not be able to complete. Lantern trying to get the sun on. Pinky taking so much damage. And Brom just beating away but can't quite get it. First blood over to North Coast. And that is what you want to see from this bottom lane. The Varus gets out scaled, but he has oh. the early power. Landon is playing with fire here as Pinky nearly dropped him with the research amount of true damage there. And this is getting really close to this bot lane. And you want it to be this. We said that the junglers were both going up top. Obviously both bot lanes are where all of a sudden they're able to pick a fight 
with the safety that they won't get that counter gank. Well, there's a gank up the top lane here, just in time now. Permacy sees the shield. Dragon with the flash will be able to help back up his top lane here, tanking up. Captain Hill will drop low and be stunned up, but that buys time for Taosu to get out. And Dragon now has to make his own escape. The Justice Punch going to be missed by Ruji there, and a nice escape from North Coast. And this is what you want to see from the side of North Coast. They play the jungle game right, use their winning bottom lane to grab themselves the first blood, fortunately going over to the barracks. And then they protect Kirtau on the top lane. Well ganked by Captain Hook, but even better responded by Dragon on that Sejuani. Yeah, now with this first blood goal, with the pressure that's being delivered to the top lane from Aquinas, they need to look for other opportunities to really start making themselves an advantage here. Maybe look towards the lane where Okwa is just trading farm back and forth with Illusion on the Karma. And really, if you get a Lulu further ahead, it helps the power of Bane as well. But this is the thing, is that Lulu isn't getting ahead at this stage. Currently, she's pushing into the Karma, but Karma has that ever so slight CS lead at this current stage. And as Lulu is currently, from the looks of the minimap, pushing, you will be able to sort of pick up that standing gold in the lane and potentially get that advantage going later on. But of course, I dare say that Lulu has the potential to transition into more of a late game scaling force because there's always the on-hit Lulu build that you can go for if you really want to play it risky. You go for the full AP kind of Lulu build, go for the one-shot pitch. Play, play to the Rune King Lulu. It's a thing, apparently. Yeah, why not? Why not, you know? First game of the finals, you have a little leniency in terms, you know, you can afford to lose one game and make a comeback. But, so why not pick a Lulu? Why not go for something a little more interesting like that? But most likely, it'll be that Arn to build. It'll be the things that hold ground to really help empower Ryze in this late game. And when you go and look at that, if you ignore the top laners, both of these compositions are identical in what they want to do. Except for maybe the support position. You've got two tank lead junglers who want to engage. You've got two supportive mid laners who really just want to sit next to their AD carry and give them shields, give them speed hurt. You've got two AD carries who want to be using that late game force. And you've got the two supports who are just going to be providing utility for their team. The difference between these two teams is is that Riven in the top lane. So the pressure is on Tier Tau to really make use of that difference. Because otherwise the bottom four of Aquinas is just gonna oh, outscale. The gang gonna happen in the mid lane. The combo landed by Captain Hill will force a flash out of Illusion and will get herself to safety on that one. But Dragon, he might be looking for some revenge here, forcing the flash also out of the Lulu. Captain Hook gonna be wild growth and just to help him disengage out of this fight. And Dragon is playing such an excellent early game. He doesn't need to provide the pressure because his lanes are doing that for them. All he needs to do is prevent Captain Hook from punishing them for that pressure. And as a result, he's doing well. You see Captain Hook go mid, burn the flash on the Karma, but then all of a sudden Dragon shows up, does exactly the same to Okiawa. The Dragon with the return gang narrowly misses the Arctic Assault, and that means Oak will be able to make it out of this one alive. But I'm loving the return gangs coming out from Dragon as well. Just really punishing those flashes, and that's something Captain Hook hasn't been able to do yet. He didn't burn Tiertail's flash in that top lane, so he hasn't had the ability to go and return. Ryzy though, Right. Taking quite a bit of damage here from this Varus. Yeah, and with one stack away from the Bronx as well, that could be very dangerous for the Vayne Dealers. It has the two sums, has the ability to get out if need be, but Ryze really desperate to try to keep up and farm with the Ocean. And the pressure's starting to pay off. We've seen about a 10 CS lead here for the Varus in the top lane. The Ocean doing quite well at this stage, but Lantern taking quite a bit of poke. Yeah, lucky the Unbreakable stops like the Void Rift going through the shield, but it still applies the sack. You still get the research damage coming through. So it makes it a lot harder for Lantern to fully block damage, especially when the Disintegration Ray becomes available at level 6. And getting that true damage is really the key here for the Aquinas bottom lane. It is that count to three, get true damage. Both of those champions in the vein, in the Valkos, do have that mechanic. So there is the potential that even if we see Northcote get ahead, perhaps get a bit tankier, the true damage could give them quite a bit of comeback potential. Yeah, that's what they're really going to need to have a line on as the goal lead is slowly creeping up for Northcote at this point. And right now, Illusion slowly building up that lead as well in the middle. They haven't really touched much on how this matchup is going to impact in terms of this early and mid game. It is really just a matter of push advantage in this fight. You're not really expecting them to get much too too much kill pressure on each other, mainly because they are just support mid laners. You don't expect them to get kills on themselves. If a gank occurred, you might see it. Captain Hook showing up. Speaking of a gank, Captain Hook did try to get a gank off there, but you're just gonna see Illusion just walk right out of that one. A little bit eager, I'd argue, from the Jarvan, but he can give it a shot. And this is what 
I think Captain Hook's making the mistake trying to gank oh. this little lane. Speaking of a mistake, you've seen the ultimate coming out on the ocean. The flash from Pinky will buy him some time. Glacial knockout will secure the kill for the Sejuani. And there's a good pick coming out from North Coast. Dragon, he comes out and says, I am tired of responding to Captain Hook's ganks. I'm going to go and make a gank my own. He visits the bottom lane where they find Pinky on the immobile Velkos out by himself, perhaps pushed a bit too far up. All they need to do, layer the CC. Sure, they miss the ultimates, but the zoning it does, it prevents them from this backing away. The tower dive here, Upstart. The sec on the rise will buy some time, but the permafrost comes through, ultimate will not be enough. And Mawushin claiming that kill. As it's being answered up in the top lane, Ruzi with the heroic entrance will be able to kill the killers. Captain Hulk narrowly makes it out of that tower. But both ganks are successful. The difference being North Coat can grab the first tower. Oh, well, they, that, yeah, there they we get go. it now. There we go. I had a bit of a heart attack there, thought they wouldn't take it. But the early pressure that North Coat is providing, all of a sudden they come out to a 3k gold lead before 10 minutes. And that's crucial for the team as well. You've got a Riven who wants to be snowballing this game. So building up this early lead will help out a lot. Sure, it's not on the Riven, but the rest of the team can help compensate for that. And even though Riven's getting camped, still 100 gold ahead. Purely because of that global objective, providing them with the gold and a Mountain Drake on the back end as well. Yeah, with no vision for Aquinas, it's gonna most likely go to here. Have a Pinky now spotting this one out. One of the try signs, Disintegration Raid will burn through it, but they just back off, wait for it to drop low, so that you see Ashley Landon claiming that dragon for himself. And it is patience there from the side of North Coat. They see the ultimate and they don't panic. They just back away, they judge the damage. They know that it won't kill the dragon off because you can't activate that true damage on it. And as a result, they do pick up that Mountain Drake they do pick up, as I said earlier, the 3k, C 3k gold lead, and they are really well set moving into this mid game. Well, with Mountain Dragon, you have the true damage coming out to all objectives, so they'll be able to push down these towers more effectively. So, if a successful bank goes onto Okwa or onto Ruti, it most likely will be that tower falling as well. And now look to them to shift their play towards the top side. We do see the bottom lane, Motion and Lantern moving into that red buff area. So they're activating the lane swap. And this is what we see teams do with early pressure at a very high level. They take the bottom lane tower, they move top, they snowball it into that other tower. And we do see potentially Ruti in for a rude shock. Yeah, he sees Marushi, he sees Lantern, but also Dragon here to help as well. The Sun will come through as well as the Glacial Prison, and Marushin will claim that kill. And he didn't have the opportunity to flash, he didn't have the opportunity to do anything there, because it is just a smooth chain of CC. The Varus ultimate into the Brown Concussive Blows, into the Sejuani ultimate. No counterplay at all to that combination. And all of a sudden, they're going to start getting some free time on this tower. Well, they've got the, they've got the jungle of the top lanes. Now there's three people on the top lanes. Now. Sure, it's full health, but it won't last for long. And I don't think Captain Hook can really make much of an impact here. However, Pinky is joining as well. Now, this is where you need to start seeing North Coat potentially play a bit safer. They do burn the teleport out of the Galio, though. Yeah, I see Dragon just take a bit of poke as well. True damage will come through, but at this point in the game, with Pinky being that support, not going to do that much damage. And we are starting to see the winning lanes for North Coast come out to a larger advantage. 10, 20 CS lead for the Riven in the top lane, 20 CS lead for the Varus in that 80 carry position. And they're just playing this early game to a T. Yeah, they're doing it extremely well right now. It was Varus being 3 and 0. Oh, using so much advantage going on. Speaking of advantage, they're looking for more. The Glacial Prison will be used up on Saruti. The sun comes through, but Captain Hook is doing the combo the wrong way around. A bit unfortunate there for the jungle of Aquinas, but a nice way to respond to the pressure. And that is what, that is heartbreaking there for the side of Aquinas, because if he pulled off that combo correctly, all of a sudden you get the Cataclysm onto the Varus. Varus doesn't have a flash, and then immediately you have Velkoz, you have the Galio ultimate which you can still use. That is a dead Varus if you pull that off, but a slight mechanical misplay just costs him that. Hopefully we don't see much more of it. Yeah, should have been happy for that. Cool. I see some of those first game nerves coming through up stuff. They can definitely pull this one back. It's not over just yet, but right now North Coast are keeping the pressure up. Dragon looking at invading the red buff as Mawushin will gain the kill on Pink in the top side of Brucey using the heroic entrance as an escape tool rather than an engage tool. And this is just excellent movements oh, no. coming out here. See him really stunned up there by the prom passive. We'll be able to walk out of that one alive because he's a bit tanky than Pinky as I can think.
And when you look at the Varus, you look at the Brow, the power of those two champions. <laughs> Captain that, Hook seems to be really good at taking camps away at this stage. He's really good at the 50-50s. Getting, getting quite good at that. But it isn't really helping him at all that much. Sure, he's getting these minor objectives, but you have a bot lane who is just able to layer an ultimate. Oh, over the Ruji. Gets the kill over on the lantern. That's Torn doing so much work. Blazer Pressure will narrowly miss, but the slow is still there. Captain Hook, Cataclysm will buy some time, but Illusion will claim the one there. Ryzy is trapped in with Dragon, but Dragon is also dropping extremely low. The kill does come over for the Bane. Samba will buy some time. Looking for that counter by their Tide 2, though. Will we be able to claim this one here? Pinky with his integration play. Will we be able to clean up that kill into Illusion? Meanwhile, Malusion 1v1's the galley in the top lane. So much action here. It's Tide 2. Now, trying to fight out Okwa here while going to buy some time. Taizu trying to run away with a flash. The Glitter Lance will claim the kill for the Lulu. And the game is standard. The game is clean. All of a sudden, the mass bursts out into chaos. Kills everywhere. I believe it did end up being a roughly even trade in the end. Both teams getting an equal number of kills. But the key things to take out of this are top lane to North Coast. They grab the tower, they get that little bit of extra gold on top of it, as well as you can look towards some of these summoners as well. I think a lot more summoners burnt for the side of a client here. All of Vayne, the Flash on Lulu, all of summoners from Ruchi, as well as the exhaust coming out from Pinky. So, definitely well done by North Coast here. And this is the thing. You look at the Varus, he's only just hit his Gunso's power spike. He hasn't had to sit on that blasting rod that you really don't want to sit on when you do build that item on an AD carry. And as a result, if you thought he was a problem now, he's going to come back. He is going to be incredibly strong. He's got a Gunso's and a Zeal at 15 minutes. Yeah, most likely to be built into a Rune Arms as well to add on that additional wave clear. And once those two items are complete, he's going to be shredding through the front line of Aquinas. Captain Hook really won't matter anymore to Motion here, but right now, just going back to this passive play style, taking a step back and realizing that North Goat does have that massive 5 to 6k gold lead. And it's just that Varus Brown pain train Ooh. coming out from the side of North Coat. Thank you, thank so much damage there. They're just able to walk up to these towers, send out a Varus Q, send out a Karma Q potentially as well, zone people off these towers, because they have the CC to dive you. They will layer everything on top of you. You won't be able to move. So if you step too far forward, you get caught by one thing, all of a sudden you're dead. Yeah, and very quick as well, especially due to the squishy members coming out from Aquinas as well. Like Ryze, like Okwa, who hasn't really built any of these tank stats. But right now the tower guys are off the table outside, they're looking for this risk here. And this is good, because it means that they're able to take it, and then use it just to further cement their strength Ooh. in the bot lane. But a potential contest. Aquinas really wants to buy this one, they can't get this one over. The Glacial Prussian though, will land onto Okwa, while goes to buy some time. Having Illusion claiming the kill over onto Jarvan. A nice two-man stun from Riven, and the Wind Slash to back it up. Another kill going over to North Coast. Ruji doing all he can in the back line, managing to kill Lantern, but will fall as well as Mawushin claims another kill and Rift Shield from North Coat as well. And North Coat, they're up to the stage of the game, they have the lead where they want to start playing the Baron Bait. It's 17 minutes, they say, you know what, let's play the Rift Herald Bait. They take the objective, they win the fight, catching oh. out the mid lane of very And Illusion killed Pinky as well in the back end of that, it's another kill, another death timer for Aquinas to deal with. And with this Rift Herald now being used, we could see inhibitor turrets going down. This game is one wide open for us right now. There's two towers down very quickly. They're looking for more as well. Captain Hook though will be here to help answer it. And North Goat making the call to back off and let Rift Hill do its own thing. There is the dragon up. An Ocean Drake, very good I'd say at this stage to go and pick up that objective as they are tending towards that bottom side. There is always the potential that they will just back away or two man it. Well, they ignore the dragon completely. What do well, I they know? Can, they can always come back. They, they can, can always, always come, come back. back to the dragon. No rush. They've got they've got the advantage right now. There are oh, uh, oh now well, Lantern is coming out of the wood. But I'd like to bring up something that North Coat is doing very well. They back away and they don't all recall at once when you do have that neutral objective up. They stagger the backs, and as a result, you don't have that period where North Coat just has zero map pressure. It means that you can't see Aquinas rushing out of the base and then proceeding to go and just pick up that dragon. Instead, they keep a few members out there, provide that little bit of pressure that they need, and as a result, Aquinas. The pressure's still on, and they aren't able to pick up anything, even though we see North Coast back away completely. Well, right now, we don't, they don't have really objectives, uh, uh, um, can't really fight these objectives right now, like the Dragon, like the Baron, because they're so far behind. They need to just look to scale this one up, look to get Vayne as far ahead as possible. Because right now, she's only sitting on that static shift. She needs an IE, she needs another crit item, most likely as well, to start giving the same amount of damage that you're going to see my Wushin dealing in these fights. 
and Vayne doesn't have to opt into the Blade of the Room King at this current stage because there isn't really anyone overly tanky. You've got the Sejuani, but that's only one. You're confident enough with the true damage. So you don't need that percentage of max health damage that the Blade of the Room King provides. So you can get that killer squishy build going. You can get the Static Shiv, get the IE. And if he does hit that stage... I'm seeing a Wombo combo here outside. Captain Hogg's over the wall waiting for the right moment to jump over. How he's got though. Uh, this is the one that's going to back it out. They stole the red buff, they take it away. But if Captain Hook went over there, that could have been a three man cataclysm, three man disintegration rate. And that possibility is why I don't like them putting the Lulu into that middle lane. They have that wombo combo inherent, but Belkos, he doesn't have much AP. He's building support. Sure, he's got the blasting wand, obviously looking potentially either towards a Landry's or a Void Staff. But if you put him in the mid lane, all of a sudden the damage is so much more, and that wombo combo that you just mentioned is so much more potent. Yeah, right now though, North Coast just taking their time, pushing up these waves. Baron sporting only 10 seconds, and might look to make that very early, very aggressive Baron tape, which will really blow open the game for them. And they are playing this right. Step one of taking the Baron, push up your waves. And they're doing that to the point where they're actually getting auto attacks on the turret. So all they need to do is keep this going. Make sure that Aquinas isn't able to get towards that Baron pit. Because you look at the vision for the side of Aquinas around that region. The furthest ward they have up is that ward right next to Pinky on your screens right now. That is as far as they can go. But they can't go any further without the risk of being died by all the CC that North Goat have. And Dragon is the one that looks to try to set that up. Most likely over onto Aqua or maybe even Captain Hook if he's feeling ambitious. Fuji. Just in front again, and now be the ultimate burn by Mawushin. They want to clap on the Gelder, but a nice two man knockout, two man cataclysm. The Wombo combo is here. Three man heroic interest will mean Atlanta will fall to Rising. Dragon doing all he can to buy some time, and you're gonna see Taiju pick up the kill over onto Binkai, but a double kill now for the Ribbon, and North go turn around that massive Wombo combo in their favor. The engage coming out from Aquinas, it is good. They get what they want, and that is damage on the carries but they don't have enough to really get those kills. Sure, they get Lantern, but apart from that, you all of a sudden, your cooldowns are spent. And the jungler's in now as well, up top. That means they have the smite of Arnold Baron, be something they want to look to contest now, because there's no way that Aquinas can really steal this one if the smite is up for Dragon. And it's just a matter of whether or not they think they're ahead enough, if they have those items, to be able to get down that Baron quite quickly. But they will just back away, as we do see the replay here coming out. Rooty, this is where Northcote make a bit of a mistake. We're going to see Ruti come forward and mess up the knock-up here. Yeah, and, then and then we're going to see the Varasalt land on that, and they're going to start using their CC abilities on the tank. And at this stage, they can't really burst him down. All of a sudden, the Jarvan gets in brilliant Cataclysm into that Vel'Koz Disintegration Ray. And imagine if that was a mid lane Vel'Koz. Imagine if you had damage in that disintegration ray, and then after that, Hi, two, just comes in, Captain Hook up. getting a bit too bloodthirsty. No need for him to go in there, and then Tirtor on the ribbon, excellently flanked, picking up a double kill for his troubles. And Northcote is slowly, but surely, running away at this game right now. Close to ten thousand gold up over Aquinas, and things are looking dire now. Especially because Northcote can ideally match the scaling that you're going to see Aquinas bring to the table. And it is just a matter of Northcote keeping up the pressure. Because Aquinas, they do have the scaling factor purely because of that vein. So we need to see Northcote using that split push advantage they have with the ribbon in the top lane and making use of this early power of the Rams, making use of all the CC that they have inherent in their composition. And if they can do that, then they are well set to finish out this game without Aquinas really having any in at all into a comeback. Yeah, right now, I've just seen the vision game, something played around these objectives. The Baron is out in the eyes of North Coast. Yeah, they're trying to bait out all of Aquinas' wards so they can start clearing them out, set up the vision for themselves, and start up this objective, which I don't think Aquinas can really answer. And North Coast is doing this in a textbook fashion. They push up the waves, they clear the vision, they push up the waves again, and then you can start all of a sudden pulling out the sort of bait. Ooh. Speaking of bait, Landon wants to get a plan to Plinky. The Glacier Prison will land, Glacier Prison to knock him up as well. So much CC, and Mawushin will claim that kill over on to the Velcons. Now what's interesting to notice there is that Ruti uses the Galio ultimate, but at some point it gets cancelled. So I don't quite know what caused that, but it prevents really any follow-up as a result of the engage onto the support, and it gives Baron 
away to North Coast. Yeah, North Coast with the pick, will claim the Baron for themselves, tries to claim that kill for his own, and now North Coast with Baron Mouth, what they're gonna do up top, where do they go with this? This is where you wanna see them split into that 4-1, Riven off to a side lane, and then you wanna see the rest of the four-man unit going into that other lane. But they don't need to, they can just all group up as five at this stage, and Aquinas cannot challenge them. They're so far ahead at this point upside, and with this inner tower getting lower and lower by the second, Aquinas is not even going to want to contest this one here, giving it over free to North Coast. Right now, Wave Flare is the name of the game for Aquinas. And their composition isn't exactly well set to do that. Look at your Wave Flare, you've got the Static Shiv coming out from the vein, and you've got Lulu. That isn't exactly Wave play that you would want. You'd much rather prefer to be the Karma, prefer to be the Varus, if you were in that Siege situation. So Aquinas, they're not well prepared to really play out this turtling game. So they really need to start trying to make plays, make picks, but North Coast isn't letting them. They're just going around as a five-man unit. Yeah, it's so hard for Aquinas to find their in into this game right now with a Baron buff. It makes it oh so much harder for the Pinky though. Really trying to keep the vision up for the side of Aquinas. Try to give them an idea of where the team is. And right now with Infernal Dragon up in 30 seconds, that's most likely what's next up on the list for North Coast. And an item pick I've just noticed that is really showing how Northcote want and need to play the game. Righteous Glory on Sejuani isn't something you regularly see, but considering how they want to play it, getting off these constants and gauges, it's a brilliant item pickup, and I really have to applaud Dragon on making that slight innovation. Even clearing out the blast cone there, making sure that when they do take this Dragon, it's completely safe. They have no interest at all in any comeback from Aquinas. Yeah, and right now Aquinas, uh, slowly moving towards the Infernal Dragon, maybe trying to contest this one, but with so much vision set up on North Coast, they can see him coming a mile away. Blue Wolf will spot it out, and the Disintegration Dragon nearly picks it up, A Dragon will claim that Dragon as well. That's three now completed for North Coast, and with this Elder Dragon hits, it's going to be even harder for a to come back. And I believe at this stage they have an Infernal, a Mountain, and an Ocean. That's correct. That is a brilliant trinity to have. You've got that little bit of sustain if you ever want to see it. You have the Varus, and the Karma, zoning some poke there if you want to do that. You have the Infernal Drake, which when you have a triple threat composition, is just so potent. You have the Riven getting burned. Ooh. And then Madbound of Pegasus lands and is taking a lot of CC. But right now he's so tanky, unbreakable, buying him so much time in the back end. And Aquinas can't really find the opening in North Coast that they need. They're just bursting down the tower so, so quickly. And while all this Ooh. is happening, the ultimate is used. Today's division is missed, but Captain Hook looks like he might be picked out anyway. Narrowly gets out of the Karma W to buy himself some time. But meanwhile, Taizu is being in the top lane without any answer. And this is the 4 and one you wanted to see North Coast play. Oh no, Rising caught out! The Wujin will claim that kill here. So much ultimate spin, but so worse for North Coast. And that is how North Coast composition works. You get hit by one CC, you get hit by all CC, and they're going for the dive. They're going for the dive. Anyway, Dragon, a little bit over and vicious, will fall, but two quick kills for Mawuj and Bruzi, trying to be the hero for his team right now, tank it up, but so much damage out of the a triple kill coming through. That's gonna be the base, broken, and North Coast, sieging down some numbers that might even look for the end. They have Baron minions and 40 second death timers. This could easily be the end of the game. Lands in flash, here the disintegration rate to buy some time. <coughs> Selva being used to tank. The minions up, Illusion, doing all they can here. This one tower, but they're running out of minions. They might have to back off up this one. Malusian. Here comes another wave! Malusian is ready, he's trying to get this one down here, but Rising's back up, so low health members, one kill for the Bane, will he look for more? Taito with that first hit, the flash, the dodge, the Karma Q, Malusian wants to take this one up, but Rising will not be able to do it! Taito trying to chase down Pinky, Pinky will have fall Nobody can the deal tier 2 at this stage, you can end it here! Taito doing so much damage, a double kill for the Riven, looking for more! Oko with the Wild Growth to buy some time! And right now, North Coast are so close to winning, but they can't just do it. They need to make up their minds. Do they continue to apply pressure, potentially costing them extended death timers? Or do they just go for the finish? They're trying to back it off here. They're looking towards the mid lane now, with Dragon pushing up the wave. They're just gonna grab another inhibitor off it and calm down this game a bit. And all of a sudden, North Coast breaks open the game in dominant fashion. At this stage, you want Aquinas to start just really planning for game two. There's the crowd, they're hyped, they're loving it. Northcote's loving it, Aquinas, not so much. Well Aquinas, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in this game here, really upside. In terms of this early pressure and how to play around this early game, because Northcote, arguably the best early game team here in the high school league.
and you're seeing now the wonderful wonder that is Brown taking Raptor Camp. And here we're seeing the replay of how Ryze got caught out. Look at all of the CC coming through. All of Lulu's abilities get used on him, but it's no point. He's not able to move. He stays locked in that position. Just ends up dying. I like this decision here as well. So they just commit to the tower dive. And when Dragon goes in, sure, he does die very quickly, but no one is on Marush and he sneaks around the side. No one's hitting him. And with so much damage, the Gunso's proc with a zeal crit item doing so much damage. And now for North Coast, it does look like they're just going to apply some pressure on that top lane, get rid of that last inhibitor, inhibitor tower. And from that stage onwards, it's really only one fight away. Maybe not even that, as there is only one Nexus turret. One final push here for North Coast. And if Aquinas want to really get back into this game, they need to win a lot of team fights. A lot of team fights consistently as well. So they can't afford to lose a single one. It was Glacial Prison over on Zeruzi. might make it hard. Rudy means they see so much. Wild growth will not be enough. You think Cat Hill go in and drop to Dragon as well. That's two quick kills. Ribbon, Taito flashing in. That's Pinky this is dead. the game. Rising is trying to bend all that he can, but they can't do it. Nika Tower has four. The bit that kills the Lulu and it's just a bang left. Dropping to Mawusian. And that's North Coast for the game one victory. And what a game coming out from North Coast. Right from the very beginning, they know what they want to do. They say, we're going to play early, we're going to play early hard, and as a result, the game before you. They take hold of the game right from minute one, and they never give Aquinas that in. And that just North Coast awesome early game ability coming out here with the Olaf, with everything coming through. But right now, we want to throw it back to Analyst to break down that epic game one. Thanks very much, Jumping Up started. What a game one that was. North Coast coming out of the gates, storming. That was an amazing victory. There was a lot of action all across the map, but a lot of focus coming out from that bot lane. That was a very fed Varus, gentlemen. Yeah, I think I owe you an apology. You said that bot lane was a lane to watch, and it certainly was, mate. There's a lot going on. There's, uh, there's something that I really, and I talked about a little bit, how scrappy this game is. Clearly, Northcote uh, drafted for a team that every two minutes, every time those ultimates were up, they were making plays. And that's the kind of proactiveness that I really want to see from Aquinas in this next game. If they're looking to take it back to get my prediction of 2-1 potentially in their favor, they're going to go back to the drawing board, I think, because there's a lot of time they spent kind of, and they were quite late to objectives. They need to get there early, so making sure that they're the first ones to be making these plays. Oh, it, it comes back to what I said before the game started, right? Before game one, I said, can Aquinas play from behind? They've always been able to play from ahead, sure, that's fine. But immediately, from the back, right at the start of the game, they were getting ganked in the bottom lane, even in the mid lane, and they were just getting disadvantages everywhere. And to their credit as well, they were playing a late game composition. It struggled a little bit in the early game, but they never managed to pull their feet back up on the ground. And so, touching on that composition wise, we mentioned these guys have strong top laners, strong mid laners, yet they pick. Lulu and Galio in both of those lanes respectively, that's changing up their playstyle. I mean, is, that, is the grand final really the time to do that? Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, which is that they're, they're moving away from the style that they've played previously by having, you know, they previously had carry mid laners. They had Malzahar, Katarina, Syndra, Talia. Like, these are all characters that have a really, really big impact on the map. And the other thing is that Aquinas looked like they said that they were playing for late game, and they certainly they picked Lulu and Vayne. But they also picked a lot of things that want to go in. Right? They picked the Galio, they picked the Jarvan, and it can be really, really difficult to stall a game out with those characters because they don't have a lot of wave clear. And the only way that they find fights is by going super hard. So they have to play really disciplined and know which fights they take and not just get sucked into whatever. That's kind of it, right? We saw when there were times where sort of half the team was within half of the warrant. They really need to kind of go to the drawing board in this champ select particularly and just kind of bring themselves together a bit. There were times we saw it, particularly in that top lane around the tier 2 turret, where they really had their fight on, the Valkons got all of their abilities off, we saw that they were finally in unison for once. But for the rest of the game it was very disjointed, so if they can bring it together, this next game could be theirs. Alright gentlemen, we're going to take one last look at one of the fights that happened during the match, and it was near the end of the game as well. So this is at the point where Aquinas are already horribly behind. We'll see it play out here. And right, so this, this is, is typically the how most of the fights started, right? Sejuani's in there, and then we've got another ultimate, and another one. Just so much crowd control. They do try to come back, but their full tank is already dead. Nothing to do from here. Yeah, the main thing is that Galio was completely CC locked. He was stunned. 
So the, he had no chance to use his shield, which makes him much, much tankier. And so he died 30-40% faster than he would normally otherwise, and they didn't have enough on the front line for Vayne to do her job after that. I mean, even to that point, right, Galio, sure he didn't get a shield, didn't get that extra tankiness, but still a tank character that's usually buying these tank items. However, that's your main tank, just burst down right at the start of the fight. We saw it happen early on against, I believe, the Vayne on the AD carry, which is, you expect that, you say, look, look squishy AD carry, yeah, burst out right at the start of the fight. Later on, it happens to your main tank. Whether he's got that ability up or not, the fact that he was burst down so quickly is pretty, pretty, pretty much showing how far behind Aquinas were. So, as we're moving into game two, what would we like to see coming out from Aquinas to try and take this to a one-all score, right? They've drafted in the first game for a very focused carry style on their AD carry. Maybe they should go back to their roots. You know, I talk about how scrappy the Challenger series is and how up until now we've always seen, you know, before 15 minutes at least both teams have died at least once. Um, but I think for this next game particularly, they need to slow it down a bit. Uh, Northcote were very great at just getting their pace and making sure they were at objectives before anyone else was, making, making the calls preemptively. If Aquinas want to take this game out, they need to be able, they need to be in the, the, the control seat, right? They need to be able to slow the pace of the game, make sure that they're ahead and make sure they're aware of when objectives are spawning so they know how to at least put wards down, you know, to start. Put wards down. <laughs> Brilliant advice from the analyst here. <laughs> but to, to be fair, it is actually really good advice. I mean, I'd like to see more wards coming out from them as well. And you mentioned this, is that they're always kind of late to the objectives, yeah. always one step behind. Uh, and Northcote, they felt a little bit like Swain, who's always five steps ahead of you. So now coming into this next game, more wards to keep the vision and keeping track of where North Coat are going so you can predict their movements and then stay on top of it. And I'd also, I'd like to see a more carry heavy style from both the mid lane and top lane coming out from Aquinas so that they can start dictating the fights. Yeah, I, I would like to see Aquinas return to the style that they've played previously and change their mindset a little bit around their, their macro play and start asking what's next. You know, where does the enemy team want to be? Where do we want to be? And who's in charge right now? You know, if the other team is ahead, then you have to respect what their plan is and play around that. If you're ahead, then you get to dictate the, pa the pace of the game. And I'd like to see them recognize which position they're in and then ask what's next and actually show up in time. Because a comp with Varus and Karma should not be getting damage on a tower if the other team is there, but they weren't there. And so Northcote actually got quite a lot of free damage on towers. It's just a big missed opportunity for a client. If I can just quickly jump in on that point as well. You know, you're talking about how they need to be aware of what's coming next. Even in Champion Select, they knew that they were picking for this vein, but I don't think I saw Jarvan visit the bot lane at least once, you know? Um, and particularly, I think we saw a gank in towards Riven quite early on, and then wasn't revisited again. There, there was a lot of opportunities to punish, and they need to see how they can look to take these small leads that they're getting and turn them into much larger gold gaps, or even just a bit of pressure. Just something, use what they've got and turn it into something else. All right, gentlemen, a lot of fine points there, but as we get the lobby set up for game number two in the best of three, Northcote are already up one game. They only have to win one more game to take out the grand finals in the challenger division of high school league. But before we get into game number two, we will go to a short break.
We've lived with the idea that good is good enough. We've accepted the honest. Yes, welcome back to the High School League Grand Finals. We're in the Challenger Division Grand Finals, and this is Aquinas versus Northcote College. We're actually in the middle of the series, and Northcote have just smashed through game number one, absolutely demolishing Aquinas. Now, Aquinas have had some time to reform as they get into the lobby, but before we get into things, my name is Matt Smite Ross. I've got Johnny Cyclone Weatherly and Jamie on the end over here, and they're going to be breaking down the games with me as we get through the analyst desk. Now, we've seen game number one. We've talked about a little bit of what we want to see coming up from Aquinas coming into game two. What are Northcote going to do to keep their lead and win the next game to take out the series? Well, it's really interesting you ask, Smite, because we've just been informed that Northcote have actually subbed in a new AD carry even after that performance. <laughs> so we're not sure. You, you weren't fed enough. We need the next guy. Yeah, is it, like if it's not 20 kills, you know, you're out or something. Maybe he's just tired, stand up like watching Yeah, the I think maybe that's what it is. He expended all of his godly power in that game and he just needs a bit of a break to recharge. You know, there is still potentially two games in that if they drop this one, they can still pick it up again. Um, so all for giving playtime to everyone that can. Yeah, well, looking into this with the new player, Rosera, as the AD carry for Northcote. They've got, he's got a lot to prove, right? Because Northcote put on a stellar performance, so we're looking to see if this AD carry can hold up his end of the bargain. And remember, Aquinas may completely change their composition. We've been talking about it. This is something new that they brought out in game number one, that composition with the vein in the bottom lane. So now we might see some solo lane carries from the mid and top lane, or they might go for the same thing. We're not too sure. We'd like to see the first option, but... It sounds like the lobby is ready. So, we will be getting into the game very, very shortly. We're going to throw it over to our boys at the caster's desk. Jump and upstart. Take it away, boys. Thank you very much, Smite. I am Alex Jumperowski, and joining me here to cast your finals here today is Jake Upstart, Kelly Holtz, and Jake. That first game was a complete zomp for Northcote definitely going very heavy in their favor. And now the pressure all of a sudden has been placed on Aquinas. They need to take the next two games if they want to win. And if you thought it was bad enough, all of a sudden playing on stage, playing in front of what has been an amazing crowd so far, now you not only need to play in front of this environment, but you need to play excellently, perfectly in this environment. And going into Champion Select, you have to really start to wonder how much pressure is on Aquinas at this stage. Especially because now they've swapped over to the red side with Northcote now being the blue side team. And with that, Northcote gets that first pick. Could be crucial for them. And now you want to see them try and get some of their picks coming on. Get into a position where they're able to meet Northcote in that early game and transition into that late game where they've said that they think they are the stronger team. The difference, what happened last game was that they opted in for that late scaling style they said that they would do, they think they're good, strong at, but they didn't manage to reach that stage. Northcote just played the early game so well, got so far ahead, that they weren't able to scale up. And the bands happening so far, almost exactly the same as we saw last game. Almost identical, just some order differences here, but it's just getting rid of those pocket pits that all these players have. Getting the Olaf off Taito, getting Calista off Malusian, but now it's Rosera subbing in, so that could have been an interesting ban instead. However, still it's a great takeaway, as it's a really good hyper carry. And the Lulu ban coming through, not wanting to have that flex, it Actually, it's interesting here. They ban away the Lulu. All of a sudden, Aquinas are left with the decision. We either ban Jana, incredibly powerful, or we give it over to Northcote College for that first pick. 
And that's big as well, because if you give the genre that's so much disengaged, and that takes away some of your late game potential as well, because you can't get on top of the enemy. Instead, opt in, take away the Sejuani, get rid of the engage of Dragon. Equally a strong pick, but I think the Jana would be more influential. The one thing, of course, that is in favor of Aquinas giving over the Jana is that it doesn't really play into North Coast style. We saw how they got that advantage in the early game, and it was through CC layering. You take away the Sejuani, who was a big part of that, you take and the Janna doesn't really do much. Not as good as the Braum in terms of giving that ability just to shut someone down and put damage. The Tristana mentioned most yeah, it's, one the most, it's one of the most picked ADC here. And you've the got the tristana Janna combination. If you want a late game pairing to really carry you through, it is that combination here. Heavy emphasis on Ryzy and Pinky moving into this later game. And you've also got the, you've got the lane swap option coming to as well. If you see Ryzy and Pinky get ahead in this bot lane, they'll take first tower, they'll move up to top lane, take another one as well, and that means you've got Tristana, two towers up, most likely a kill or two up, and that's going to be a really easy game for Aquinas to move towards the victory. But they just go for the brown, potentially as well, although they have had that Eddie carry switch. They can opt in for that same early game potential. If you, because Tristana Jana, it's a heavy, heavily bullyable lane. If you're able to bully that lane out, it doesn't really do much. So quite easily exploitable here for the side of North Coast. But they do pick up the Twitch. Twitch is going to be picked up for Azira in the AEC role. And that also is the same level of carry as Trisana would be when it comes to this late game. Arguably with more damage across the entire team, which could mean disastrous uh, disastling for Aquinas here. As Yasuo currently being hovered for Okawa in the mid lane. Most likely not going to be that Katarina is also another option. Ok Okawa, he's hovering over these assassin mid laners and it's not really something that you want to see. Sure, it provides the damage, but one of the weaknesses that Aquinas had that stopped them from stalling out into that late game was their wave clear. They didn't have any. Sure, you had the Lulu, but Lulu doesn't do much in terms of wave clear later on. You want to be saving those abilities for the slow, for the utility they provide. So you want to see Okawa really pick up perhaps a more utility mid laner, thinking along the lines of an Azir, of an Oriana. Something that can clear those waves quite easily and then transition into a very powerful team fighting damage threat. The only problem is with that upside is that you like Oakwell does love his lane style champs as well. He likes Cindy Lights Mouser because he's got that lane pressure built in. He wants to be able to bully enemy into submission in terms of this early game. And champ picks like Oriana, picks like Azir can't really do that all too well unless it's a melee matchup. But you go and look at the two compositions so far, both of them picking up the bottom lane and the jungler. You have the Gragas and the Jarvan on the opposite sides of the jungle matchup. Quite even there in terms of who gets the dueling. Really depends on who finds who first. And then you have this bottom lane. And at this stage, I'm actually going to give it over to the side of Aquinas. Just having that range support matchup, as well as Tristana being a bit stronger in the very early stages, having that push advantage early on. Yeah, we did see last game now, Ryzy was making good plays as well, just a bit too far behind to make them work perfectly. So he is there to be the character of the team if he needs to be. And with the Gangplank being that last band, a nice little pocket pick taken away from Ruchi, I'd really like this combination coming out from Aquinas. And that really prevents what the analyst desk was saying. Aquinas, get your top and your mid on carries. All of a sudden, they take away a mid carry, they take away a top lane carry. And you might actually be forcing Aquinas into that position. And Rudy, he's forced into the Galio again, saving the mid lane counter pick for Okawa. Well, it can be put to mid lane as well, especially if it's Corky is locked in. Galio, with the measure as his tank, does quite well into Corky due to the magic attack coming out from his passive. So it's a nice little flex picked up by Aquinas and a good way to add more to the front line. But Northcote now, all of a sudden, they have very good late game scaling. They've completely switched up their style, and if Aquinas was preparing for it, and if this Darius is, goes through, it goes through, we're seeing a Darius in that top lane. Quite a frequent challenger pick, purely because it is strong in all stages of the game, even though it's ever so slightly counterable. And it's, it, this goes with the way that Taiji likes to play. He likes to play his aggressive laners as well, similar to Okwa in the mid lane. So pick up the Darius in the top lane is something similar, but however, the Fizz gonna be locked in here, most likely going to Kawa in the mid lane. It could be a top lane flex, but I heavily doubt that. Although it does appear as though we will be coming out of the lobby, potentially a mistake picked yeah. up there it for the Fizz. It happens. But, and I do think the Fizz is a mistake. You have a cop team that has said that they want to go late. They want to play, get to that later stage of the game, scale up, and you don't pick any wave clear. 
if you want to get to that later stage of the game, you need to pick wave clear, purely because it just helps you stall out those turrets. It prevents people just from pushing up minion waves into you, getting down tower damage. Because if you don't have that wave clear, all of a sudden you're going to start leaking objectives, and you won't hit that game, because all of a sudden the opposition team, much like last game, has enormous amounts of tower gold, they're enormously ahead, and you're left, basically left to turtle in your base and hope they make a mistake. Yeah, as far as I can see, um, so the only wave clear they have is a Drasana, and kind of this Galeon Greg as well, they have decent wave clear for this tank roll, but not quite the best for this. So if Aquinas has to fall behind again like they did in the last game, it's going to be very hard for them to look forward to getting to this late game, because you're going to see Twitch come online, you're going to see Darius come online, and how are you going to keep Drasana alive that long? Well, Jana is obviously brilliant into the Darius, Fair enough. Darius takes all the time to walk in there, and then he's just pushed out by the Janna. But even then, you know, last game, you could say that there was a timer on North Coach composition. But all of a sudden, they don't have that. They have the scaling coming out from the Twitch. They have the scaling coming out from the middle lane and that Darius. So they have the ability to play quite effectively at all stages of the game. Yeah, and that's where the North Coast really shines. So if they get this early game advantage and they've still got some mid game, still got some late game potential, when they've got this advantage, they're not going to lose it. There's no way they're going to be able to take this one away. And Aquinas really need to put the emphasis on getting ahead early in this game to really make an impact. And if the Fizz pick does go through, all of a sudden, so much emphasis is on Oikawa finding Rosera on that Twitch. Because if he doesn't pull off that assassination before Twitch is able to really let loose, the pick becomes useless. Because Fizz, he's there to burst someone down. And if you don't do that, all of a sudden he starts to fade away, he starts to wear off. And it's a very risky pick. And I do like the bravado that they do have picking up that champion in the deciding game. Match point here for the challenger final. Yeah, because if North would take away this victory, they walk away the high school league challenger grand champions. And right now with that fizz pick, it's going to be so hard. You're going to have to see Oko come out to great feet just to land that shark onto the Twitch. Because if it doesn't happen, they're going to win the North Coast winning team fight easy peasy. Because of course there is still the front line for the side of um, North Coast. They have the ability to block out that fish. They have the Darius. They have the Jarvan. So you're going to be relying upon these flanks, relying upon really getting behind that very beefy front line from the side of North Coast and getting on top of the carries. But even if you do get on top of those carries, there's a brown there to potentially knock you up to provide that barrier to that um, fish. And if you don't pull that off, again, I'll say it again actually because it is important. Fizz becomes useless in team fights if you can't burst someone down. Well, you always got the split push off, I guess, as well. Fizz can be quite a effective split pusher if you build for it. But with that Fizz build, you're going to be opening out a full team fighting. It'll be a 4 1 comp, and you're expecting Fizz to get solo kills later on in the game, which could, might not happen as Fizz starts to fall off in that late game as tanks and other champions start to match his level of damage. And when you look at the composition of. Again, we're not sure if the Fizz is going through the stage, so it's all conjecture. All hypothetical here. All hypothetical. But if the Fizz goes go through, all of a sudden you see Aquinas have the ability to play the 1-3-1. One, one. They can put up the Galio in the top lane, he has the global pleasure. Fizz having that emphasis on the bottom side. But then all of a sudden you're matching a Galio into a Darius in the side lane. Yeah, it makes it really hard for Aquinas to find that winning 1-3-1 one, one push. And with the Fizz, you can opt for that Teleport Summoner spell instead of the Ignite because you have so much burst damage. And look at little kids, even they're enjoying this game here. Yep, League of Legends, not really a game for game all for ages. All. Uh, it's a, most ages. Mo most ages. Anyone can watch it, anyone can... If you can use a keyboard and mouse, you can play it. If you can use a keyboard and mouse, you can play it. I swear some of my solo queue matches are like that as well. But as I attest to, just because you can use a keyboard and mouse doesn't mean you can play it well. Yeah, Bronze. sorry, Jake. Woo. Sorry about that one upside. You can't really win it all, can you? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but back, bring back to this game here. Look at this game. North Coast are also going in with the idea that they've won the first game. They're one game away. So they've got the confidence wings of this game as well. So is that going to really help them out in this or are they going to play a little bit too aggressive for them? I will say that they are going to probably try to play this aggressively. Do exactly what they did last game. But the style in which they've done this pick and ban immediately, I think it's a stroke of genius. Because often you see teams, if they win, they don't switch things up, they play the same style, they keep up doing the same, keep on doing the same thing until the point it doesn't work. North Coast, they're gonna have none of that. 
they're just going to go and say a few Aquinas supporters there in the crowd. Hopefully they won't go home overly disappointed. No, I think, Aquinas, I think Aquinas has an opportunity here. I, I put down Aquinas as the person, who, the team I think I was going to win this whole series, 2-1. And they can still do that. They've got the reverse sweep capabilities here. And if they can do it off this game, I believe in them. Do, do you think it's all just a part of their master plan? Lose the first game, that way it's so more, I keep my more reverse, yeah, when you win? That's exactly what it is, upside. They want to try to satisfy my prediction. Yeah, so I'll come back to my previous point is that you see a lot of teams. As we are into the game, never mind. The Fizz pick did come through, so I'm not quite sure what happened. To I think it. a computer dropped out by looks. A computer dropped yeah. out, so we are having the same Same picks. teams, same picks, same bands, and right into this game. Game two, match point for Northcote here, and now are on your blue side. And Aquinas looking to spice things up. Five-man invade right now. And there is the potential price. that they have snuck in behind Northcote. Yeah, they this didn't see them. This could go well, or this could go horrifically wrong. They're going to find potentially oh, Lantern. They found Lantern. They're going to go into Captain Hook. We're the one to start this one off. Lantern narrowly avoids getting knocked up. We'll have to burn that flash to get out. Shield of Duran coming out from Ruji. And good job from Aquinas, forcing out that early summoner spell. And that is what you want to see from Aquinas. They didn't work last time because they lost the early game. All of a sudden, from the very first minute of the game, they start playing more towards that early style. And when you have a fizz into that court key matchup, Captain Hook needs to be really sort of trying to camp that middle lane. Because otherwise, you're going to see the fizz get heavily outscaled by the court key. Yeah, because right now, fizz is really going to be obvious for this early game. Go big or go home, really. And that's what's on the line for Aquinas here right now. As we just see, these normal jungle starts come out here. Both the bot lane side buffs. Trying to get the jungles here as quickly as possible. And one thing I would like to bring up is Jarvan into Aquinas' team composition. Galio, he has the ability to jump over a wall. Gragas has the ability to jump over a wall. Um, Fizz has the ability to jump over a wall. Everyone but Jana. Everyone but Jana, but Jana has the ability to push you out of the Cataclysm. So really the Cataclysm is going to be really hard to use in this yeah, fight. Yeah, so Jarvan, it was of course that first pick. So whether or not Aquinas meant to do it, they've almost counter-picked the Jarvan in terms of their overall composition, just packing it up with gap closes. Quite a mobile team composition. Yeah, and it will make it a little bit harder for Dragon to find those impactful cataclysms in team fights, especially if it's the start of the fight, as the initiation. It needs to be secondary, but who's going to be that first initiation? There's no one really there for North Coast to help with that. Well, you have a mobile Fizz and you have the Galio combination. If you manage to play it risky, get Fizz onto the back line into a Galio ultimate, all of a sudden you have an engage. And apart from that, you can really just let Northcote run into you. You have the Darius, you have the Jarvan who are both wanting to move forward. So if you tight back, pull them apart a bit, all of a sudden oh. you're potentially giving an in for Okawa in this Fizz to get on top of the back line when we get into the later stage of the game. But of course, Northcote this is where they won the game, in these early stages. And as a result, it's really a matter of Aquinas holding on for this, making sure that they can use Ooh. their late game. Ruji did come around though, and did land the Just on Dragon, but the EQ combo cancelling that one out. And really, North Coast just wanted to keep playing this aggressive style, and I like it coming out. It gives you the confidence. You pick up this early game advantage, and you can start to run away with it. Yeah, Dragon though can't afford to play towards this bottom lane, because if they do, there's not really much you can do. You've got a Twitch and a Brown champions who, while they provide a lot of gank assist, there isn't all that much damage. And into the pure slipperiness of the Jana lane, of the Tristana, you really want to be paying your attention to this Corky, paying attention up to the Darius. Gank top lane a lot. If you get your Darius ahead, turn him into slip most pressure. Oh, Jang did try to get gank over on Ruji there, and Ruji will take a lot of damage red buff playing that slow. And Ruji though will be able to walk out that one live, and Gank Hook was there to back him up anyway. And I will see one thing that has impressed me so far in this tournament is the diligence being pulled out by the um, players when they are getting these ganks. They're willing to hold on to their summoner spells instead of panicking and using them immediately. We saw it last game with Tia Tao was ganked in the top lane on Riven very early on. And we're seeing it now from Ruti, saving that flash in the event where he does end up needing it when Tia Tao goes aggressive. Been going aggressive. That's really what T is doing in this lane. Being this Darius, he can just afford the trading constantly with Galio because the hemorrhage stacks will build up, do some more additional dot damage, and it makes it so hard for Ruti to find an opening in this lane, especially until he's built up some armor. And Ruti, it isn't about winning game at this stage. It's about going early because you have the greater team fight utility. You have a very strong global presence. 
So he wants to get up to level 6, and then it's oh. up to Aquinas. Being a presence, Ruji is going to be rudely interrupted by Cam Dragon, having a two-man tour by some time. But first blood going over to Titel. Hemorrhage Jack claiming that one, and a nice quick kill picked up by North. Coast. It isn't quite a dunk, but this is the start you want for the side of Darius, especially when you do see Darius opting in for that Ghost Flash style. He is all for beating Ruji one on one, making sure he is able to go into the side lane and be undefeatable. And with that early kill, the first blood going over to Darius, he's able to pick up Merc Treads. First in for that, tricks. I will kill you by hitting you multiple times before you can kill me style, instead of just going straight for that option. Yeah, and with that ability coming up now, it means that Tyson won't be CC as long as well, giving him a bit more time to get those auto attacks off, to get that damage out, and it means a lot more moving to the late game as well. As you see, most of the members of the players have some form of part CC. And you really have to testify to how well Northcote is again playing this early game. Darius has a CS lead. The losing lane of um, Twitch, Braum, into Tristana and Janna is even at this stage. They're managing to go aggressive in this lane. Well, Pinky, forced out. Pinky actually getting really caught out here. So much poison damage is being put onto the Janna. The heal will be used just in case Contaminate came out to pick up that kill. And that means now, with so much oppression spotlight for a Twitch Braum, you don't usually see this. And that is how you want Norco to be playing. Interrupting oh, no. the knockout. Ruji is going to be caught out once again. Two members of Norco want to try to take out this kill. So much damage coming out. Five stacks of hemorrhage, but will not be enough. Ruji walked down that one safe and sound. And if that was a level six, that would have likely been a kill for Tia Tau. Darius being able to get the dunk with that six stacks on the bleed. And playing around the top side, proving very, very effective for Norco because they're just able to keep on revisiting that lane. However though, you're seeing Razier might be a little bit caught out here. The jump coming in from Ryze. Will it be enough? Ryze claimed that kill. Lands in training immediately back there as a support and will flash to safety. A one for one overall, but the ADC gets a kill for Aquinas. And that is the difference between that play and the bottom lane. Well played by the side of Norto to get a kill back in the 3v2, but the gold goes over to the Tristana and that is who you want the gold going over to for the side of Aquinas because into the late game, she's going to be the one who needs to get through this Darius, needs to get through this Javan, needs to survive sort of the corky rockets. So if you can get gold onto the Tristana, you can get experience onto the Tristana, that is really, really well paid off. Yeah, especially with the triple crit meta coming out as well, the IE set of fire cannon builds, you see. With the Arnestes on top, there's so much GPS that Tristana can put out. And if your Tristana's ahead, up levels, up items, it's going to be even easier to do so. And you can tell that both of these supports opting in for that sort of we need really to buff our AD carries going in for that double heal. We do see it, it was an um, innovation that occurred when we did see the Ardent Sense become such a powerful item is that we saw AD carries picking up barrier instead of the traditional heal that you saw because they didn't need the exhaust because you were playing into these tanks and it was more about being able to stay alive than it was to burst someone down and prevent burst damage coming out from assassins. But with the Fizz, potentially, you might have thought that an exhaust would have been a valid option. Yeah, and what I also like to see as well sometimes that's up when this happens as well is not to get the barrier up for the cleans, especially maybe for Rising in this game. With so much CC built up on Northcote, getting rid of that stun, getting rid of that knockup could mean the difference between winning or losing a team fight. And you're just looking here. Darius ahead in the top lane by 20 CS. The bottom lane is even. We're seeing middle lane come out to a 10 CS lead. It's almost exactly the same story oh. as Dragon pays attention to the bottom yeah, lane. Dragon come down the bot lane. Captain Hook is there as well. A three on three. Captain will land. Lock in both Pinky and Captain Hook. The flash will be used. They're going to chase down. Captain Hook dropping so low. Monsoon will save his life and Aquinas get out of that sticky situation. But that is worrying. This is the lane you should be winning. And sure, it's a counter gank, but you're not getting anything out of the supposedly winning game. Both of these champions are going to do quite similar. And we're seeing Dragon stay around, keeping up the pressure. While the rest of the map isn't getting anything from the side of Aquinas. This is the lane they need to do well in this early game if they want to succeed. Because with the Fizz, they've opted into the snowballing style. But the Fizz, he isn't roaming, he isn't getting anywhere. And so it's really down to Captain Hook, Ryze and Pinky to make an advantage in this bottom lane. Yeah, because right now you're seeing Ogre being really locked in by Illusion. However, he's trying to make something work this time. No Vision has spotted him out yet, but careful Ping's coming through. Illusion did spot that Okawa was missing in the mid lane, and that's sent up dangerous singles for the Twitch. And Corky with the package. 
all of a sudden there's this really nuanced interaction between the Fizz who wants to roam and the Corky who, with that package, wants to do exactly the same thing. Oh. Mainly because Corky all of a sudden oh, no. becomes Pink. that much better at responding. Pinky caught out a little bit here. The shield will not be enough here as Azera picks up that kill with the E. And this is exactly what you see upside. It should be the other way around. And Aquinas all of a sudden starting to get flashbacks to last game where we saw these 2v1 kills happening for North Coast's bottom lane. It's a different AD carry, and sure, it's 10 minutes in, but when you have that pushing Tristana with the range support, this shouldn't be happening. Shouldn't be happening at all right now as North Coast found himself once again in a gold advantage. 2k up here as you're seeing Dragon so much pressure applied in this early game. And the CS leads are increasing. We see Razera coming out to a slight lead. We're seeing Darius now with a 40 CS lead there in that top lane, and what is a 20 CS lead in that middle lane. And North Code at this stage, the early game is so strong. Yeah, they've guaranteed themselves this early game, guaranteed themselves some time to work with here, but Aquinas still has this late game scan. They still have options moving on to this, mid, to this late game, but it's going to get a little bit harder for them moving in front of the 20, 30 minute mark. And I'd agree with your point about the late game scaling, because that was what happened last game. They do have late game scaling in the form of the Tristana. They're going to get a beefy front line. But the Fizz pick, picking up that champion, and it is such a situational champion, needs everything to go right for it to go well. All of a sudden, you don't really have that much of a late game advantage anymore because the Corky's just going to outscale your Fizz. He's going to do more in more situations. Because I said it in the pregame in that long pause. Fizz needs to kill someone in a team fight to be useful. He needs to get ahead. Otherwise, there is no utility. There is no scaling that comes from this Fizz. Oh, right now, there's a little bit of action happening in this river here, Captain Hook. Take away that scuttle crab from North Coast. But I do get what you're saying here, Upside. Really, you need to see Okra starting to make some plays around the map. And right now, especially with Corky, having those magic damage crits coming later on in the game, it's really hard to optimize a build into a mark as well. And it is a perfect team proposition, you could say, for the late game from Northcote. Frontline, frontline, frontline in all of those oh. lanes. Captain, Captain Hook, Hook fan. supporter. Got a... People bringing out signs, I love it. Yeah, however though, uh, speaking of signs, Ruji trying to take one right now. Shield Durant will buy himself some time for so much damage. The Q will land, and Taito wins the 1v1. And now Northcote have the split push win condition. They have arguably the stronger team fight in the late game, with double marksmen doing hybrid damage. And now they have that winning top laner, that Darius with the ghost of all things, who's just going to really be able to force out, apply so much pressure onto the Galio in the top lane. And you have to wonder, who do you respond to it? Because Galio is just going to get dueled out. Fizz is going to do nothing into that matchup. Who do you send up to that lane? There's no one right now that really can answer the fact that Darius is stomping up around in the top lane. But right now, Aquinas is starting to lose help on everything right now. They need to make a magical play to keep themselves alive in this grand final. And look to Captain Hook. In the previous game, he was the one making plays. He was the one almost pulling off miracle team fight, miracle engages for Northcote, for Aquinas. Look to him to make the oh. play, as he does. He's trying to make the play over onto Illusion, but the Valkyrie will get him safely over that wall, and Dragon was there just in case that counts out, just in case something was going to last a little bit longer. But it's the right attitude. You've left it late to start having an impact on the game, but it's what you want to be doing. All right now, Ryze taking a lot of damage coming through from Razira. The Sun's going to connect. Spray and Prey is used to get some additional damage down. Will it be enough, though? Monsoon will be burned from Pinky just to make sure that the E does not pick off the Trasana. But the pressure is there. They're still forcing the Tristana back. They're slowly going to be able to start pushing up these ways, getting that turret damage going. And it is a very extended laning phase compared to the last game, as we saw. 40 minutes, no towers taken down. And this is the thing. Northcote, they don't have as strong lanes as they did before. You could argue the top lane does, but they don't have that bottom lane just to take turrets down quite effectively. As a result, we're seeing this laning phase extend, but it isn't costing them anything. Darius, CS lead, almost doubling the CS of Galio at this stage. CS lead for the Corky, and you have the Twitch going even, who, with the Braum, is going to be so well set up into these late game team fights. 
Yeah, Dean's getting tight for a quiet second. Really start making some plays, especially as Dragon is still waiting his pull. And this is going to be a tower dive coming through four members of North Coast. The massive racial visit into the Cataclysm. Pinky will be the first of four. However, Ryze slips down the back end of the fight. Oakwood is out here as well to try to keep things going. But the Fizz will be summed up. Twitch claiming that kill. Captain Rock is here now oh! as Illusion pops Ryze. That three kills for North Coast. And nothing answered from Aquinas. If you want to see how well that tower dive was executed, look at the flashing health bars for the side of North Coast. They managed that so well. Dodging the tower damage, going in and out, making sure that when Aquinas overextended, when Aquinas thought that they had the end into a fight, all they had to do was turn around and start a fight. And with the ultimate being burned by Galio, as we see it here, excellently played here, locking down the bottom lane for the side. They kill Pinky off. All of a sudden, Arden Sensor is gone. There is no fight. Ryzi's backed off. Oikawa, he achieves nothing. He gets the Fizz onto Razera, but nothing else after that. And then the burst coming in from Illusion. That was, that was nasty right there. Right? So the amount of damage Corgi's putting out in this game. He hasn't even completed Triforce yet, and he's already popping Ryzi from half out. This is really, really bad for Aquinas. Not only do they get three kills, they get the first lane tower. First tower, solo gold onto that Darius. Not only is he doubling the CS, not only is he two kills up, he has the first tower gold all to himself. And the way Northcote is playing, 7k gold lead. And only 16 minutes well up. That's, that's a K gold lead up every two minutes. This is crazy coming from Northcote. We said they were good at early game, but we didn't even predict they'll be this good. And they're playing with a scaling composition. The only early game they really have is the Darius and potentially the Jarvan. The rest of your lanes are scaling lane. You had a losing bottom lane. Oh, you had a losing Ruji! Gonna lose in the 1v1. Taito with the auto attacks, with the dunk, claiming his second solo kill this game. It's just gonna be rinse and repeat for Tier Tao in this bottom lane. He just needs to keep pushing up the waves because nobody can respond to him. Yeah, and right now you're seeing Taito have with this pressure, <coughs> keeping up the split push because there's no way Aquinas can really answer this one. And with Lantern and Dragon sitting in this push, they don't see it coming. Pinky's gonna walk right into it. The damage coming through, the monster will be used, but will not be enough. Cataclysm used to secure that kill for Dragon. And that's just another quick kill bit on North Coast, keeping the ball rolling. And you could argue Aquinas having the Ardent Sensor advantage. If you continually kill the Ardent Sensor user at the beginning of each fight, and it, it, there's no point in having the Ardent Sensor there. Oh, I'm seeing lots of different signs. He's like Oakland now this time. As Ryze, if you look down to this bot lane, getting pressured out by Dragon, by Razera. They want this tower and they want to make it last as long as possible. Try to starve Aquinas of any resources. And they should be able to pick this up quite well. We see the Runin's Hurricane coming out from Twitch and all of a sudden he has the ability to push the waves. While Tristan is stuck on that sort of it's a well positioned, but a sort of awkward position at the same time. With that BF sword, with that zeal. It's sort of, I want a smoother power spike, but I'm going to delay my power spike by completing those items. By completing the zeal item, by completing that infinity edge. Well, to be honest at this point, Upside, they may as well make it last as long as possible. Make the power spike come later on in the game when you think North Goat won't be expecting it. Because right now, with that mountain dragon and up 9,000 gold over Aquinas, Right. There's no power spikes really for this Rasana. And all they need to do on the side of North Coast is keep up the pressure. Darius keeps sitting in that side lane. Really force it in. Force the point that you're ahead by as much as you are. A full... He's two items now. Two items, tier two boots, into tier two boots for the side of Rudy. Yeah, Rudy. That right. is enormously ahead really far behind right now and he's trying to opt the Abyssal Mask well and give him no protection against the Darius except for that Ninja Tabi with that bit of armor and right now Illusion popping Pinky getting that pick for North Goat and right now it's going to be so hard for Aquinas to hold on to these towers out the Arden Sensor being around. North Coat owned the bottom side jungle of Aquinas at this stage. There is no vision for Aquinas in that area. In fact I'd say at this stage of the game Aquinas' vision is too far forward in that river region. They need to get into the jungle, put those wards, so they don't do what they just did and face check into the damage of North Coast. Between the Jarvan and between the Brown, you have enough CC for that four-man unit to do well, and then you've got the Corky and the Twitch follow-up, which is huge. It's going to make it so much more impactful here. It's right now, 
Ryze can't even walk up to defend his tower here. So much pressure being delivered by Norco. He's in his auto attack zone. Captain Hook is on the side. This one's guys will be huge. It's here. Knocked back into fight. Barry and Flash will be burned instantly. And Norco had to try to disengage this one now. So Tur is there to try to make things a bit more interesting. But Aquinas is finding a good pick, but not quite the kill. He's a fish. He's landing on his arrow. That's the kill. Aqua picking up that one. And now the team fight turns. Norco getting this easy on Taizu. Can't live that long in this fight. And that's going to be another kill. Going over to Aquinas, another one for Fizz, the shutdown, the double kill, Fizz, the unofficial triple. Aquinas are still in this game. They get the wards in the jungle, and Northcote, they have no wards to guard their flanks. Captain Hook, all he does is walk up, lands a point blank body slam onto Rezera, and as a result, you just start to see Northcote crumble without that switch. And what do they do now outside? They've got this opening, where do they go? It looks like Baron might be on their minds, but it'll be a bit risky to go straight to it at this point. They don't have the damage, especially when you have the Burst Mage of the Fizz. The only real sustained damage on that Baron is going to be from that Tristana. They don't have the ability to rush it, but here is the replay. Okawa, he finally does something. He lands the fish onto the backing away Razira. And from this point onwards, the fight is won. The CC comes through. Ryzee's able just to really go and free hit this entire time, knocking down those frontliners. Because sure, the frontliners are healthy. They take a long while to kill. But if you don't have any damage threats to back them up, they do nothing. Yeah, and that point now with Fizz, Three and one at this point, he needs to be the carry right now, at least for the next 15, next 20 minutes for Aquinas until the Tristana really gets online. All the pressure now on Oakwa, their captain, to keep the game alive. And this is where you see Aquinas needing to repeat that performance again and again. Because sure, they pulled off a great fight, but it was defensive. It Speaking of fight, they're looking for another one. Ryzee jumping in the water, saved the illusion with so much damage. A two man cataclysm will seal the fate of Aquinas' front line. A double kill for Dragon, well deserved. And North Goat picked a fight in the jungle. And they managed to find the front line without those damage threats. Thus, they're able to just whittle them down without any threat of damage. There's no timeline in which they need to kill them. And with the jungler down, with the top laner down, Baron for the side of Northcote. Yet yeah, no smite to answer and no vision to boot for Aquinas. This should be a free Baron going over to Northcote. The fish is there though, won't secure it. And that means Northcote now has this Baron. And now they can play the four at one to brilliant oh, effect. Or get a pick as well outside up. Binky, a bit caught out there. We'll have to flash over the wall before the Kinsasa the flows finishes off. And Northcote building up this pressure exponentially. They burn the flash on the Jana, which means it's that much easier to kill the Ardent Sensi user for the side of Aquinas in the next fight. And they have the double marksman. These towers are going to fall down ridiculously quickly. And when you have the front line, when you have the engage coming out from the Braum, from the Jarvan, the follow up, the side lane pressure from the Darius, Northcote with this Baron buff are in such a good position to clear out this game and break into the base of Aquinas. It's very similar to the last game up south where they, when they picked up the Baron buff, the 4-1 came out. You had Riven split pushing. This time it's a Darius, and it's so hard for Aquinas to answer because out the wave there. They haven't picked the champions for it, and it's only Tristana who can really kill these waves quickly and efficiently. And this is the thing. Without that wave clear, you ha can't really reach that late game effectively. As there's potentially oh. another fight. They can look at a fight, and so far ahead. Pinky getting bursted down by Rosera, and Captain Hook with to burn the flash as well. Lucian, though, wants to chase this one. He ran right into a fizz. Exhaust will come out to buy himself some time, but that's going to be a kill. Picked up by Ryzee, a good counter, but Tower falls in mid. They're looking for more. Lantern taking a bit of damage on the Tower. Bruji trying to keep the Tower alive for Aquinas. But one for one trade it really helps find us out. Overextension there from Illusion, but Tiertau cleans it up on that bottom side. It's a two for one overall with a and they're coming through. They're looking for more. Ryze has a flash at Cataclysm instantly. Ruji trying to tax one up yet again, but can't last for too much longer. Pinky there to give himself some backup, but that's the tank gone. That's Galio down and Aquinas starting to struggle here. They need to get this tower, get the inhibitor and get out. The health bars are too low for them to do anything at this current stage. And you still have a front line, Ardent Sensor and an AD carry for the side of Aquinas. They back out, clean play, slow play. They don't need to finish the game just yet.
I used a brand buff well, I got some towers, I got the inhibitor, and I got a couple of picks as well. Sure, they lose illusion at the same time, but it's worthwhile for Northgate to keep the ball rolling, keep the advantage building up, and now 13,000 gold here. This is very similar to what last game was like. But again, they're staggering the backs. You see Tear Tower providing pressure to this bottom lane. We see Lantern providing pressure in that bottom lane. It's preventing Aquinas from getting any objectives whatsoever. Major objectives, that is, as they do pick up oh, the blue buff. Oh no! Lantern sealing away the blue buff with the Q. Oh no, Lantern. Good ward. Spots it out in the miss smite coming through from Captain Hook. And that means they're just going to kick up Ocean Dragon on the back end of it. Lantern, I think, at that stage, being reminded of game one when Captain Hook did exactly the same thing but with a Rift Scuttler. Steal the buff away with a skill shot. BM. That is not just showing how far ahead they are right now, I'm sorry. They have the moment to stop, to dance for a little bit because they've got the time to work with. They've got the gold, they've got the towers, and they can really look to set the tempo of the rest of this game. And they're providing pressure in the middle lane, drawing them down while they wait for the minion wave to come up to the bottom side. This tower is going down, no question. Aquinas shouldn't even try to um, defend it. There it goes, it does down quite quickly. And now they're stuck trying to do it, as oh, potentially. They're trying to get a pick into Dragon. The fish will land him. Dragon needs to drop if this is successful. Quite, but a massive combo coming to Tytale. Two men apprehend Oakwood, trying to do his best on the backside, but it can't quite get to where Rizera picks up the kill, and that spins down. What can Aquinas do here? Ruji tanking so much, but gets dumped by Tai2. That's two kills down. And now Aquinas has to run there, has to stay alive here. Rizy so low, Baron will be used to buy some more time. And North Coast are so close to winning this game. And that fight, it starts off so well for Aquinas. They pick off the Javan, the big front line. They had to make this work. Round. Two man apprehend will help out North Coast so much. Illusion picking up the tank. It's down to Risey. It's down to Pinky. They have to defend this one. They've, they've won the game here. There's nothing the much they can Nexus do. There's too much damage. Fallen. The Nexus is open and Risey is going to get picked off. The sun comes through. Tytel will dunk him. Pinky will drop as well to Rizera. And it's down over. That's the game. You can't do it. North Coast are your champions. What a series, I'm sorry. If there is a way to take out a final, that is it. Show me a more convincing best of three victory and I will eat my bow tie. You'll eat your bow tie with upset. That's a big challenge. However, that was such a great game from Logan. Now, the high school league challenger final. Ch uh, final, they won the finals actually, if you saw that game there. <laughs> Two owed Aquinas in fact, and that's going to be such a dominant bench from North Coast. We'll throw it back over to Analyst to break down that winning performance. And there you have it, we have the champions of the Challenger Division, North Coast College 2-0. Jamie, the only correct one on the desk, but it's been fantastic. But look. Before we get into anything about that series, we have some very deserving winners, some very deserving finalists, and we've got Dwan to meet them now. Yes, welcome in. And of course, you've just seen a fantastic one here. That was the Challenger Division for 2017. It was back and forth, but of course, Northcote are the champions. They do this one 2-0. But of course, we do have a Queen's College who are going to make their way up onto the stage and I'll present them with the runner-up medal. They're just on their way back as we wait for the captain of the team as they make their way through up into the auditorium. Come on up there. Uh, yeah. Of course, we just want to grab a few words from you. Uh, we've got some, uh, some trophies here. I'm not going to say condolences, but of course you've made it all the way here. It's been a fantastic crowd. You heard them roaring. How was the feeling, first of all, but just being in this environment? Oh yeah, it was really breathtaking with all the people coming out to watch us. Uh, I'm lucky you couldn't get the win, but it was still a real good experience, eh? And uh, everyone that was watching at home, everyone here at Armageddon, have you got some uh, words on behalf of you and the team? Ah uh, yeah, free Tyler won. <laughs> hey, there you go, big shout out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is your runner-up team. Aquinas College all the way from Tauranga. Congratulations again, guys, and we'll hopefully see you next year.
Yes, and uh, again, that was the uh, runner-up of the Challenger Division for Season 2 HSL playing League of Legends here at Armageddon, day number two. But there was plenty that entered this division and plenty that entered the tournament. And of course, you just saw it. One winner. They go in the form of Northcote College. Let's welcome them up to the stage to present their award. Round of applause. Northcote College, your winners. I will just come for a, a few words with yourself. Obviously, firstly, huge crowd here at Armageddon. Plenty on the stream that couldn't be here watching you guys get it done, basically. Uh, what are your thoughts of obviously uh, performing here on the big stage today? Um, but actually, we are quite confident at first, and then we know we, this is going to happen, so, yeah. <laughs> and again, you had lots and lots of people um, who have been supporting, particularly your school. You've got, obviously, a fantastic coach and teacher in charge of this program, which is all about developing future esports players like yourself. So do you have anything for those who want to get involved in HSL moving forward? A few words to them? Yes, just um, eSport is a really cool stuff. You guys should actually do it. Join the team and do the tournament. All right, well, again, congratulations. Northcote College are the champions of the Challenger Division for 2017. A round of applause. Northcote College, your champions. winning team there we go they've done it they've taken it out too and oh what a stunning victory the crowd has been enormous the crowd has been passionate but not much more passionate than the players themselves and honestly we've got still got to talk about that second game there because we've got to win two of them to take out the series so let's go over what happened it looked okay for Aquinas at the start of that yeah, I, I really like the playstyle that Aquinas picked for themselves. I think that that was a lot more true to the strengths and success they've had previously. Um, but I think Northcote did a really, really good job of punishing the Darius into a melee top lane matchup. They reganked it after they blew the after they blew his flash, and you saw that Darius just got absolutely steamrolling after that and became much too much for Aquinas to handle. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've got some of the results of that as well. We've got a replay coming up. and we've got, Oh, no. Actually, just kidding. We don't. But, look, <laughs> you're right. It was mostly from that top lane, just snowballing it from there. I mean, Tai 2 went absolutely bonkers in the late game, just going absolutely crazy. We saw a little bit of hope coming out from Aquinas on that fizz. I think so. They were listening to us. They did, by some stroke of God, hear us in between that, uh, that game one breakdown and did, did take in, especially in the draft, you know, much more sound. The lanes were a little bit more sensible. Um, I know the fizz pick was exciting, but it was just unfortunate. Northcote being so devastatingly strong in this series. Um, it's, I don't know if any team could have taken them out throughout the entire Challenger series. Aquinas came close, but Northcote did well. All right, gentlemen, there we have it. That was the grand finals of the Challenger Division. But if you know anything about High School League, and I sure do, there are two divisions in the tournament. And Premier is coming up to you this afternoon at 2.30 p.m. You've got Mount Roskill Grammar School taking on Mount Albert Grammar School. And I can already hear a lot of their fans in the crowd ready to go. So come back to us at 2.30 p.m. so that we can see the Premier Division finalists duke it out on the stage here at the Logitech G Esports Arena at Auckland Armageddon. But until then, we will be waiting for you on, and we'll see you very shortly in the afternoon. Let's Play Live presents the League of Legends High School League Powered by Logitech G Tech Cafe and Computer Power Plus In partnership with Xerion, Playtech and the New Zealand Esports Federation
We've lived with the idea that good is good enough. <laughs>